What does that future look like? Well, I think we'll have some great conversations today from our uh, four panel members, um, who Jane has nicely introduced, and so I'll go straight into uh, allowing them just to say a few words uh, uh, each uh, around the, the, the sorts of skills that are essential in a Hong Kong context uh, to ensure professional uh, success from their experience. And also, uh, perhaps reflecting a little bit on the UTS experience as well, and how that actually equips um, graduates to succeed. Um, so perhaps, uh, Sue, would you like to start? Thank you very much. Hello everyone, my name is Sue Campbell. I'm Managing Director of Corn Ferry Future Staff. And I live in Asia, but I actually work on, in Asia and globally. So living in Hong Kong, I have responsibility across the whole region. And one of the questions actually Jane asked me earlier was, you know, what did I learn from my experience at UTS? Um, I did all of my degree part-time, so um, while holding down a full-time job and actually also doing a part-time job. So if nothing else, that actually taught me focus. Um, and at the moment, I, my job is quite diverse. I have a lot of different time zones. I have to juggle a lot of things. And so being able to switch from one thing to the other and actually really focus on the, the task at hand is probably one of the things that, that six years of extremely hard grind, I would say, really focused me on. Um, and secondly, I, I had the opportunity to work with a lot of very, very different people in my time while I was at university. And that diversity in my career has really been very invaluable to me in terms of keeping an open mind as to how I go about learning about this region because, frankly, no one can ever learn everything about this region and really understand it. Alex, uh, you're, you're not a UTS uh, uh, graduate, but you're very close to us being uh, uh, associated with, uh, with InSearch. It's a major uh, contributor to our success in the, uh, in the international domain. Indeed, Andrew, I'm not uh, technically an alumnus, but uh, I've been with, associated with UTS for 25 years, so I have uh, near and a bit to say. <laughs> um, it, it, many of you may know that InSearch is the to UTS the pathway provider, so our role is to prepare students uh, not only to get into the university, um, but to succeed. And we've been doing this for over 25 years, so before I came on uh, and joined. Um, and we've been, most of our students come from China, Indonesia, Vietnam, India, and, uh, and many countries around the region. But I've certainly noticed over time um, such immense change. I mean, education is so key to preparing people for the workforce. And uh, we've heard from Attila today all of the, the changes uh, for, the, for the grade that have been happening at UTS. And uh, UTS really is a leader in changing the approach to uh, learning and teaching with um, collaboration, um, innovation and, and preparing people for the sorts of soft skills that they'll need uh, in, in the future. This is a massive change um, and, and education systems traditionally don't change quickly. Um, and so it's been really impressive to watch that happen. And it, it's put um, InSearch in a, in a position more recently of, of um, even more acutely needing to pay attention to how we prepare students to transition from a, uh, a, a more traditional high school system uh, into this new way of, of learning at the university, uh, that's sometimes referred to as hybrid learning. Thanks, Alex, and I think we'll explore some of those, uh, those issues with uh, how we learn in, in that changing world later on. Christina, from, uh, uh, from the executive position in Citigroup. Thank you. Um, I'm Christina Chang, I run Structured Finance for Citi in Asia Pacific. Uh, so we help a lot of companies um, raise financing against different types of assets. And, and uh, I manage a, a team of um, people throughout Asia Pacific, including both in Hong Kong and also in Sydney. Uh, I started um, at UTS uh, a number of years ago. I did a um, combined business and law degree. And um, I think what UTS helped me, uh, three different things I was thinking about tonight. Um, first is, is really working with a team of people and working within teams and being comfortable in engaging and, and bringing out the best of everyone with that, within that team and motivating team members or having team members motivate, motivate each other 
to excel and to, to contribute as a, as a team. So that was a very important experience. Um, I was saying that I'm still in contact with a number of people within my um, study group uh, at UTS and took certain subjects specifically in mooting and was um, coached and trained by the professors to participate in a number of um, competitions representing UTS. And it was really through that experience um, I gained a, uh, a great expertise and, and experience in, um, in being able to present, develop arguments, present arguments, and uh, respond to, to questions from, from the judge um, regarding the specific arguments. So developing the ability to, to think on your feet and to communicate arguments in a very clear, concise manner. Look, when I reflected on, um, on UTS, um, which seems like such a long time ago, uh, there were probably two things. One was, um, was that the only constant would be change, and that was a bit of a truism, but it has been true in my life. And the other one, I always remember, we were just about to graduate, and we had this um, marketing lecture, and he told us that we were all going to be spectacularly unsuccessful, because um, we didn't have inquiring minds. And that idea of having an inquiring mind, I think, is really important. I was um, recently asked to go and speak at an event in uh, Mumbai, called NASCOM. And again, I, I misjudged the audience and thought there would be a hundred, and there were some sort of 1,500 people there, which I, I kind of picked up a couple of days before. But I had a speech I was giving about customers are changing and are you ready? And it was about an index we had done with The Economist about digital um, capability or digital nations, effectively, in Asia. Uh, and obviously, uh, Hong Kong does very well, Singapore does well, Korea does well. Uh, and, uh, and India wasn't as high on this index, and I was trying to think how I was going to position it in, uh, in that home country. And, uh, and suddenly this index was kind of a little bit out of date, and so the only constant is obviously change. Because within three months of the last time I had been there, and also when we produced this study, the Indian market had been absolutely, uh, I suppose, disrupted by Reliance Geo coming in. Uh, there'd been the uh, demonetization that happened in India, uh, and suddenly you had, uh, you know, uh, something like I think uh, mobile wallets going from 35 million subscribers to something like 200 million in a month, uh, and you also had the introduction of uh, corporate uh, uh, citizen IDs, and so suddenly this position I was going to take about India and how you know it could do more. Um, but suddenly update and that had been leaped from in many respects. So I think for me, only constant change and also having inquiring mind. And, and just following up on that then, Ellie, uh, I mean, the digital revolution, we hear so much about it and we hear so much about the impact it's having on all, all nature of business. Um, and in your role at, at Telstra, you must see this all the time. So, so what are the sorts of things that Telstra are doing to sort of power um, the, uh, the, the future changes that this digital revolution will continue to bring? Yeah, that's a good question. I think you can't go to a tech conference without someone talking about digitization and it is almost like bingo. You know, 10 years ago you would go somewhere and people would talk about cloud and they would be trying to define it and a day later they'd still be defining it. Um, so digitization is one of those ones which I think is just now on trend. But the reason people are talking about it I think is very simple. I mean, if you think about it, even being as a consumer or as a B2B environment, you are just demanding more um, in terms of your digital experience. I think the second reason is obviously, you know, very basically, it's table stakes for any organisation or any government, quite frankly, to have a strong digital strategy, and that can even extend your product life cycle, introduce you to different markets. Um, and thirdly, and, and one probably people don't talk a lot about, is people want your digital footprint. So Reliance Geo in India, who have just invested 28 billion and gave away uh, 4G networking for something like six months and then got 100 million subscribers. The reason their CEO said that he did it is he just wanted people's um, digital footprint. Look, in Telstra we have a strong digital strategy, as does any major corporate you will talk to. Uh, the things we're talking about are things like digital experience. It sounds really basic, but to actually say that you will actually start thinking about a digital experience by putting the customer first rather than right at the end of the process. Which again, does sound basic, but quite frankly, if you've worked in organizations for a long time, that is often not what happens. Uh, we're looking at our digital platform, which again sounds a bit boring, but we're looking at the architecture of our business. A lot of industries, you will see legacy systems which just do not talk to each other, and therefore you can't get information flowing through those systems. So for us, the second thing we're working on is around digital platforms and the architecture of that. We have a bit of a saying that digital doesn't equal a platform, uh, sorry, a portal. You can have a, a portal up front and still have lots of people scurrying away in the background. So it really is to get an end-to-end -end flow. And the final thing is really to look at digital ways of working. So looking at how do you go from a waterfall approach to working. 
to far more of a DevOps or an Agile. Uh, where we're, so I think we're embracing it, we're investing heavily. Uh, and where we don't have the skill sets, we either partner, we acquire, uh, or we build um, innovation hubs. And we have a number, we have one here in Singapore that's been really successful. We've run it over the last few years. Terrific. And Christine, your, your sector's been massively transformed by, by technology as well with FinTech and, uh, and all the implications that that has everything from cyber security to the to the uh, user experience and engagement with with, uh, with customers in all sorts of different ways. What's your perception on where this is all going? Um, yeah, I mean, definitely. I think the digitalization of, of banking has been very, very important, um, particularly in areas such as uh, consumer banking and the experience of, of consumers and their engagement with with um, banking as a service, uh, as well as in the corporate world, particularly as, as corporates are looking to move large amounts of money uh, around the world, but be able to keep track of that in a very simple, efficient manner. Um, we do see uh, City being, um, or using its advantages, being at the forefront of digitalization to, to achieve market share, both, both in the corporate banking as well as in the consumer banking sector. I think in the area where I'm in, um, we see technology uh, and being at keeping up with technology very important to how we communicate to our customers and how we deliver uh, our services and package our services to, to customers. And uh, it's also been very important to understand how um, technology impacts our customers, uh, their businesses, um, and how we can be sure to understand that their development of their, their businesses um, uh, leverages off the, the technology. So, um, and personally, we've been working with a lot of uh, fintech companies um, as they you know, de develop um, large pools of, of consumer finance receivables and look at different ways of financing those. And we have been very involved in, in looking at uh, financing of such, such pools of um, consumer finance businesses. And so really understanding how they, how they originate um, facing a customer or how, how, how do they assess a customer using technology, um, how are the loans underwritten, and then finally, do we feel comfortable um, financing those those um, receivables and uh, you know, how do they differ from traditional banking? And I guess in both of your sectors, uh, uh, there's a whole new ecosystem of businesses forming that are, that, that are actually supporting that. Uh, and everybody's vying for, for, for talent now, in one form or another. So you, you, you've got a background in accounting and work with the big four and all that. Um, but now you're in the heart of the people business. And, uh, and I guess the, the, the future that we're trying to create here is really dependent on people, which is their capacity to be able to work in this environment to uh, to deal with the change, to come up with new ideas. What's your perspective on how this is all playing out? I absolutely agree that the future is dependent on people, and, and certainly technology scares a lot of people. Um, and a lot of people are worried that their skills will become redundant, or indeed that they themselves will not necessarily be able to fit into the new world. And some of the research that we've done recently around the future of work is we've actually asked chief executives questions around how they value people versus how they value technology. And valuing people is actually really difficult. Um, and one of the things that we've come up with talking a lot about is how organisation structures will in fact change. And those structural changes will lead to the changes in jobs. And when I talk about an organisation structure change, what I mean is that more and more people will be employed in what's called the gig economy. So they will be freelancers, they won't necessarily be in full-time work. Um, and that, for a lot of people, is a terrifying concept. Um, one, in fact, that I would say has taken off in many Western economies a lot faster than it has in this part of the world. And secondly, the people who will have permanent jobs, their roles will actually be much bigger, potentially a great deal more ambiguous, and therefore the skills that they need to have circle back to one of the things we touched on earlier, which is about inquiring minds and operating in ambiguity, means you need to be more agile. So from the, uh, the perspective of the university and uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the work that you do as well in preparing people for university, what does the world look like for these people? Um, well, I probably would pick up on the, on the word ambiguity because uh, with, with things changing so quickly, um, in searches like UTS engaging with uh, digitization on a number of ways, in a number of ways, um, through the the uh, recruitment and marketing, uh, through the student management uh, platform, and uh, and through social media. But we, with things changing so rapidly, we have students who are much more afraid with uh, technology 
and a whole range of social media tools that are our teachers. Um, but our teachers have the, the, the content knowledge and, and, and the, the ways in, in being able to um, induct students into moving on, moving past just the digitization. I think Ellie was making a point on this as well and getting to the heart of things. We still need um, to learn, we still need inquiry, and we still need to encourage um, engagement in, uh, uh, collaboratively in the learning process. And so we're bringing our teachers along uh, <coughs> with the, the ride, so to speak, and, um, and managing that ambiguous uh, set of relationships across what happens in the classroom with students, um, what teachers are doing, how we're engaging with the university, um, and, and being aware of the, the, the cultural and, and uh, teaching backgrounds of the students we have. Um, and, and, and dealing with the, I uh, you know, might use the word bleeding, if you like, of um, communication in the classroom, outside the classroom. Um, it, it used to be the case that uh, a lot of schools would we ban the use of mobile phones in, in classes. We actually encourage the use of them, but we try to, um, we aim to engage learners to use those devices um, as part of their, the, the learning tools. And so you've really got the learning process, processes and learning community moving beyond just the, the classroom experience. It's one of the paradoxes, isn't it? In, in one sense, uh, the technological change that we see uh, is, is creating uh, challenges, but on the other hand, it's creating opportunities. And, and whether it's in the learning environment, whether it's in the workplace, uh, that that sort of uh, harnessing technology to create opportunities to embrace them uh, is, is kind of fundamental to what uh, uh, graduates are going to need to do in future, and indeed the future workforce is going to need to embrace that as well. So leveraging innovation uh, and innovative technologies to uh, to master the skills is a leadership skill. Uh, and Ellie, that, that's, uh, um, that's something I, I guess uh, very much worth thinking about for, for what we actually need to encourage students and graduates and, uh, and our people to, to embrace. Yeah, I mean I was at a, um, uh, a conference probably 18 months ago and Meg Whitman was one of the speakers and, and for those of you who know her obviously are uh, not only now the, the CEO of HPE and, uh, and chair of uh, HPE Inc, but obviously had a history with eBay, had run for governor of, uh, of California, uh, and it had a long history uh, and started off, I think, as a management consultant. But one of the things she said, and I think it, it's, it's very true, is that all companies are becoming technology companies. So it doesn't matter if you're in banking or if you're in uh, you know, recruitment or if you're in outsourcing or if you're in government, that everybody is becoming a technology company. And I think it then makes it really incumbent on everybody that that domain is no longer obviously just the CIO, it's not the domain of the chief digital officer. Um, you know, when we are out selling to enterprise customers, we're selling more to the chief marketing officer than anyone because they often hold the digital budgets. Um, so I think, you know, that those times of saying, well, technology was very much someone else's domain is no longer the case. And so I suppose I would challenge people to say, if you don't really understand what augmented reality is or machine learning or uh, IoT or 5G or 3D or any acronym you can think of, then it's probably worth spending some time doing it because if you're not thinking about how that technology is potentially going to impact on your customers, your industry, your employees, then you're probably doing yourself and uh, I think your business quite a huge disservice. Um, the other thing I'd probably say is, you know, you do need to you know, come with that idea of starting with the future in mind, which is quite a change for a lot of people to start with the future in mind. Um, often people to start today, we've got a problem, this is how we think we're going to fix it. The other thing I'd probably say is, um, for all of us, if you think about the element of disruption um, within most of the industries we work in, uh, you know, if, uh, if what has made you successful, you know, has got you to here, I, I don't really think it's going to get you any further. So I suppose when you do think you have the answers, you probably need to stop and, and disrupt yourself a little bit further as well. And the only thing I would say, and it was nice to hear Adela talk about, you know, um, I think a higher purpose in some respects. You know, I think being a, a leader in, in, uh, in organisations today, having that higher purpose and being clear about, obviously, not only the vision of your business, um, but that wider social impact is actually really important. 
I sound like my mother. She always just talks about you know the last person she's talked to. But I, I go back to my story in India. Um, we closed out in India, and I had a fantastic uh, dinner with the CEO of Tech Mahindra, and a really interesting guy. And obviously, he'd seen a lot of change. Uh, and the reason it was interesting was the conversation went from digitization to the partition of India um, to the theory of abundance, and that was in an hour. The reason I say it is just you know to have that balance across. You know, an interest I think is really important, um, but then to also have an interest in obviously the social impact of some of the technologies that we're seeing is really important as well. And following right along from that, I, that, that high purpose means that uh, we think about doing things differently. And uh, Christina, tell us a little bit about what you're doing there and how, how technology and innovation is driving that initiative. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, I think we use the currently at City when we look at um, recruiting or engaging with the community. Technology is a very important part of that, um, particularly uh, engaging with with youth and um, as as we encourage youth to develop their careers and to consider careers in banking and other industries. Being able to connect at the same terms on the same wavelength, in using the same communication tools and techniques. Um, as uh, generation or the current generation is, is very very important. Um, we've also seen um, at the forefront of recruiting that that if we um, if, if we don't consider the way that um, youth currently thinks about work uh, about the value of work, um, then it's very hard to attract um, bright talented people to um, to to our industry. Uh, so we do use a lot of social media in in uh, reaching out to the community. <coughs> Uh, packaging you know, our message in, in ways that um, uh, that the current generation understands. Um, but we also, also when we, we speak to the community, we're also, and think about the, the, the changing world and the changing uh, mode of work, I, I think something that, um, that Sue mentioned is, is very important as well, is that um, not only is it important to keep up to date with technology and to have the hard skills that technology requires, but I think soft skills are increasingly important to differentiate yourself, um, given that we're now in a world where there's so much technology, so much dig digitalization, that a, a human voice or a human judgment or human recommendation um, and developing trust on a human basis is, is very important differentiator. Uh, so that's often what we um, will communicate to the current generation that comes in is that yes, Technology being up to date, with technology being comfortable te with technology, is so important. But what is as important, if not more, is being able to 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 engage with people on a human basis, and that's something I think that UTS also also provides. So, Sue, so Vice Chancellor's told us fifteen jobs, some of which don't even exist. Um, that can be fairly scary. If you're going to give us here. Um, a piece of advice out of what you've seen uh, with the changes to date and, and, and where it's going. Um, what would that advice look like? How would we share with, uh, with, our, with our colleagues um, how to be future ready? Um, there's more than one piece of advice, I think. Um, What's the magic one? <laughs> um, I think we've touched on so many of these things already. The importance of being a leader. Um, Technology is only as good as the way in which we apply it to the problems that we have. Um, so being a, a thought leader, being innovative, and the way in which one goes about doing that is actually often by listening and learning from others. And so to be responsible for your own lifelong learning is actually one of those things that actually can truly transform your ability to be a leader because if you keep ahead of the curve. You, don't, you yourself do not become obsolete if you continue to learn. And in order to do that, you really do need to pay attention to the people around you, the things around you, be open to new ideas. Um, and I often tell our clients that aligning their business strategy and their people strategy is the single most important thing that they can do to make sure that they have the right people doing the right things at the right time and that they continue to evolve their workforce. We've got a bit of time for some questions. If you'd like to ask some questions uh, uh, from people on the panel, we do have, I think, a roving microphone. Um, and there's one over there. Um, strategically placed behind the camera. 
Yes. <laughs> um, actually, my name is John. Um, graduated from UTS twice because I'm a masochist. Um, I have a couple of questions, actually. The first one is for, uh, for Christina. Um, I, live, I have lived in China for 21 years, right? So um, I, I have seen in 21 years people in Beijing going to the Bank of China, getting their passbook into the counter to find out how much money they had. Well, I have married Chinese. And last week we go shopping and we don't need money. We don't need but wallets. Everything is paid by my phone, right? Because I go to the shop in the local market, I put my phone, I scan, put the money, it's gone, it's finished. So I'm wondering, first of all, what is going to happen with Citibank if there is no people with money? Okay, I mean, this is technology, right? Uh, that's the first one. The second, the second question is actually that this, this panel... We might let Christina answer the first question. Okay. <laughs> I think that's a very good question. Uh, so the whole concept of payment systems is, is changing very rapidly, uh, particularly how consumers on the consumer front, how consumers engage with, uh, with payment systems. And so I think um, for, for banks, really, it's, it's important for us to, 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 to take a step back and, and look at um, you know, how things are developing, how we can participate in the development. Um, but also something that Ellie said, we can't be thinking what is a problem now that we're missing out on, but what we have to think is about is what is the opportunity in 10 years' time uh, and how do we participate in that. And I think it's not only changing banking, but it's also changing many, many industries, uh, such as um, uh, the energy sector. A lot of um, um, you know, oil and natural resources companies are very focused on, on, on that sector, or even uh, auto manufacturers. They, Things are changing so quickly, they need to think about where they need to be in 10 years' time to compete and how do they participate in that today. It's fair to say, though, I mean, I think the banks were one of the early leaders in, in terms of digitization as well and, and really have been outstanding. I mean, one of the, the interesting things is that Orange, so Orange, obviously OBS in, in France, um, the telco, they have actually launched a bank and they've launched it off the back of obviously their mobile subscribers so that they had access into that market already. So I think, you know, massive transformation is on. Uh, one quick one? Yeah, a quick one. Um, actually, uh, the, the point that I wanted to make very quickly is that this, this panel is a little bit um, on the server side, right? Because I come from the engineering side and I have seen enormous changes in China regarding technology, right? So a company, for instance, like Uniqlo, they design materials in Italy. They send the pictures to the machine in China. They make the material in China, and then they send the material to Bangladesh to bake the goods and send them over. So here, what we're talking about is banking, telecommunications, and human resources. But we're not talking about manufacturing and, and the future of manufacturing, which we will still need, especially with electrical cars coming, right? Which in Australia, they don't know anything about it yet. <laughs> okay? uh, and in China, the government in Shenzhen has said that by 2020, all the taxis are going to be electrical taxis. And the buses, half of them are electrical buses now. So I'm a little bit disappointed about that part. Sorry. Well, maybe we'll come back next year and talk to you about the, uh, the, the uh, uh, future of manufacturing. But you can be assured that uh, uh, we could have assembled any number of panels to look at different uh, different sectors. And you I left out education. Uh, uh, yeah, the education's there. I suspect that um, every single sector uh, that we could conceive of is going to change the way in which it does uh, it does operate. Um, the sorts of networks that are formed, the sorts of connectivity between the different parts of the uh, uh, the sector, uh, that will evolve over time, as it has done historically as well. But I think fundamentally. Um, that, that the pace of that change is going to ramp up as the expectations of the way in which we, we do business, the way in which we want to, uh, uh, to manage our, uh, our social life and uh, the, the other dimensions of life will, will, will change. So next year we'll try and think of a whole other range of things, but I suspect the challenge will be the same. Uh, work is changing, the skills that we need are changing, the role of education is, is going to be uh, immersed in that, uh, and, and equally, 
Um, I think that the, uh, the, the future is going to need the same set of skills, resilience, um, adaptability, all of the things that our panelists and I have talked about. Other questions? For the first time there's four generations working side by side in the workplace. Um, and I think Telstra and Combank are on a very similar journey in terms of ex-government organisations, antiquated systems which don't talk to each other but also from the banking side of things from City, I'm keen to get your understanding of what are some of the things that you're doing. You've talked a lot about attracting younger talent and technology, but we also have um, mature workers and baby boomers. So yeah, just keen to get your thoughts on what you're doing in the organization to make sure that those four generations can work side by side. I think, um, thank you for the question, and, and CBA are also a wonderful client of ours, so thank you for that as well. Um, Look, we're doing a lot, of, and I, I think I just sat on a diversity and inclusion uh, session yesterday, and I think, you know, often when people would think about diversity and inclusion, it was often, you know, gender, or, and then it became LGBTI, and, and you know, now there's, there's far more talk about, for us, around talent and how we attract talent and how we retrain, uh, retain talent, um, how we work with people with disability. So I think if we start thinking about diversity and what it really means to me, it's that idea of really diversity of thought. Uh, and so I think what we're trying to engender is an, an environment where you actually encourage diversity of thought and you recognise that that can come from different uh, ethnic environments, from different genders, but from different age groups, from different um, uh, social standings and also from different educations. So I think from us we're doing a lot to try and actually recognise that within our, within our businesses. Um, we spend a lot of time on looking at, uh, at our training and, and what we're doing for people and I think that's really changed a lot. Um, we're huge users of Yammer, so social within our environments and creating lots of different communities of interest which quite frankly are, are open to everybody. We recently did I think a, an EES survey, so an employee opinion survey. What always fascinates me there is that there's often young people who are really engaged and people when they get more to my age, they're sort of 45. Um, largely because, and older, largely because you know, you've had differences in your life. Um, we do a lot around flexibility and I think we've been, you know, um, given our technology background, a real leader in that path. Often when I ask people at the end of a skip meeting, why do you work for Telstra? Um, I am amazed, it doesn't matter what country I'm in, um, people just tell me it's because I get to work flexibly. And that can be in US, it can be in uh, the UK, it can be in you know, uh, France, it can be here in Hong Kong. Um, so we're doing a lot around diversity of thought, inclusion, but also around flexibility in the workplace as well. And quite frankly, that's been a real winner for us in terms of retaining key talent as well. That's a good question. I think that uh, you're right, a lot of the time, particularly in the banking industry, a very traditional, um, very demanding industry, particularly in the, the, the corporate side of things, that um, we do do um, focus a lot about um, attracting young talent, like graduate talent. So, uh, I, I do think that there is probably not enough focus on how do we ensure that there is career longevity as well. Um, there's no there's no real uh, deliberate focus on that. I think that it's it's something that that will be important um, to to change over time. Um, but some things that Ellie mentioned are also a focus of um, uh, of the banking industry and of City. Um, it more goes to retaining retaining talent, um, but not to to deliberate deliberately looking at career longevity. But things such as um, giving people a, an opportunity to be to, to have career mobility, so moving countries, um, moving moving departments, moving areas. Um, so there is a big focus on, on career mobility and I think that as people have careers that span uh, 20, 30, 40 plus, plus years, being able to, to change environments, to change um, uh, the, the type of work that you, you uh, are in is important um, to, to have a fresh set of eyes looking at different areas. So you would see this intergenerational issue in the, the sorts of people that you work with as well. I'm, I'm just wondering whether you're seeing um, uh, changes over time in, in the way in which different generations engage with technology and embrace it. Uh, I reflect on my elderly aunt who probably, um, uh, probably does embrace technology faster than I do in some ways in some of the things that, that, that she does by necessity as much as anything else. I can comment about it in relation to the organisation that I work with. So Conferry is a, a search firm by legacy and so 
probably the average age of a partner at Corn Ferry is 10 to 15 years older than me. Um, maybe even a little bit older than that. Um, and the average age of the business that I run, which is Future Step, is probably about 27. So I have very, very different issues around how I engage my staff in terms of a sense of purpose, the way in which they use technology, the way we go to market when we look for candidates is radically different to the way in which you know, another division of the very same organisation engages with their staff, engages with their customers, their candidates, their clients, and we often give advice to our clients about how do they really change their talent attraction strategies and segment it in the very same way that they would segment a customer base. And so social media is used, we use Yammer as well, social media is used heavily in my business. And I'm sure if I sit next to a, a partner, a Ferry partner in the office, literally next to me, I'm sure if I said to him, what's Yammer, he'd be like, what are you talking about? <laughs> so, so we use different means in our organisation to engage our different groups in a way that's relevant to them. Time for one last question. My name is Gary. Um, I run a small telco in Australia. Um, so I've got a question for the panel. Um, today we talked about the future of work. Um, what I think at the moment is more the near future of work, how we're working today and probably the next two, three years, where technology is supporting what we do supporting decision making. Uh, but if we can take it a, a step further, um, an example being, you know, uh, machines beating the best in the world in chess, machines beating the best in the world in AlphaGo. Um, it seems like, and also you know, um, driverless cars, it seems like decision making is uh, transiting towards the machine and we becoming the support infrastructure behind it. So if we take it further, maybe a 10 year or, or 20 year view, where do you see it? But maybe I'll steer away from Telstra because we know that closing an IPVPN deal is not machine based. It's, it's all human interaction. So maybe over up to the panel on what do you think in 10, 20 years time, how machines and artificial, artificial intelligence and also big data will drive decision making or make decisions that we become the arms and legs? Who wants to take that one? I would just say very quickly that um, I, as an optimist, I would see the opportunity for uh, humans to pursue more higher level decision making um, and the services industry will, will grow. Um, I'm sure my colleagues on the panel would have more to say about that. And I can relate to it in our organisation. So we're in the process of rolling out artificial intelligence software to do candidate sourcing. And so that's you know, not exactly groundbreaking. It's been around for a long time, but it hasn't necessarily been that accurate. So now it's a great deal more accurate. And so many of our staff were initially terrified that that would mean that what they were doing, which was sourcing candidates, would make them redundant. And our view is that it won't make them redundant because all it does is substitute a part of what they do. And in actual fact, what we need them to do is once the candidates have been found by the artificial intelligence tool, is they have to engage with them. So it comes back to that being higher level of engagement, very much more, I guess, socially capable individuals, um, having people who can make decisions and develop, I guess, a strategy the machine's not going to do that for them. All the machine will do is probably the part of the job that actually is you know, a one, two, three. So I think we probably should, should wrap up at this point. I, I should add that the, um, many of the reports that have talked about the, the, um, uh, the loss of these jobs um, that are, are being displaced by automation, by, um, uh, by data and computing, uh, do talk about the fact that the jobs that remain are those that require the high level skills, the innovation, the creativity, sometimes even the craft based skills that, uh, uh, that even the most ambitious machines can't actually solve. So I think the opportunity for us and for universities, in particular UTS, um, is to try to continue to provide the skill sets that people need uh, across the course of uh, a very diverse career. And so that 10% offer that the Vice Chancellor talked about is there for you whenever you're ready to have it. Would you join me in thanking the panel for a wonderful discussion? This <laughs>